Okay, let's get started, shall we? So we are at the end of week eight and um, getting close to the home stretch here. And uh, today we are going to talk about chapter 12 and about um, intervening, taking an active approach of some sort in the hopes of uh, keeping healthy relationships healthy or uh, repairing relationships that are struggling. And uh, I'll be lecturing two days, I think I mentioned this on Tuesday, on chapter 12. Uh, it's important material. Um, it's interesting material, I think. And it's uh, actually rather different in focus and aim from where we've been for virtually every other lecture up to this point. And I say that because now what we're trying to do when we're asking the question, what do you do to make relationships healthy and strong? Uh, a, an interesting question, an inter interesting domain all by itself, we're, taking a, a, we're making a transition from saying, here's how we think we understand this question of why some relationships are great and others struggle and why even great relationships struggle at certain times, right? That's our, sort of our orienting question all, all quarter. That's it. We, we think about that uh, in um, people in psychological science and in fields, social, social science fields, make a distinction between basic research and applied research. Basic research is how does it work? How do things work? How do things work when they're going well? How do things fall apart when they fall apart? Uh, what is the basic means by which, in our case, relationships function and operate? It's basic research. Applied research says, how do we intervene? How do we take steps to ameliorate a, sit a certain situation, in our case, relationships? So we now move into this applied domain. We now move into the application of all that other knowledge that we've been talking about for the last eight weeks. Okay, so that's the transition that we make now. And it's a, a complicated transition because when someone shows up at your door and says, you know, I want my relationship to be better or I don't want my relationship to look like my parents' relationship, uh, you then have to say, well, how does all that knowledge base, how does all that understanding of relationships from the basic research translate over to the case that's sitting in front of you? Right? So that's the important challenge is how do you adjust and adapt and uh, uh, apply, essentially, the knowledge that we have about relationships in the service of helping the one relationship that might be right in front of you, okay? So that's our challenge. How do we do that? What do we know? What do we know about relationships that gives us some kind of advantage, some kind of leverage for making relationships better, okay? Now, one of the things that I want you to know, and in fact, this will be in a, a question on the exam. One of the things I want you to know is that when we think about application, when we say, oh, how do I make relationships healthy, whole, strong, better, in whatever way that makes sense, we often sort of immediately assume or believe that um, that's a therapeutic undertaking, right? That, oh, that means that you would think about therapy. And you would think about therapy, but that's not the only thing you think about, okay? So when you try to um, articulate ways in which knowledge could be applied to improve couples and families, part of it is what we would think of as tertiary prevention, tertiary intervention, okay? And that is, uh, sorry, that is to say that we intervene before it's too late. But that's not the only kind of intervention that we would think about engaging in, right? We often think of this as a broader uh, st uh, strategy of prevention. How do we prevent things from going in a bad direction, right? Well, it depends on where you're starting from, right? If a couple shows up at your door and says, if you don't fix this problem, if we don't fix this problem, we're probably going to get divorced. Well, guess what? That's tertiary prevention. That's preventing a problem before it's really too late. And that is couples therapy, right? And that's for usually for couples who are distressed and 
really thinking about maybe alternative arrangements for their uh, relationship. But there are other kinds of intervention that we can think about. And they're all within this umbrella of prevention. One of them is to say, how do you intervene and create circumstances so that relationships in general can be really healthy? We think of that as primary prevention. Primary prevention is uh, intervening before some problem ever has a chance of happening. Okay? So in our water system, for example, there is fluoride. You may not know it, it's in there. That fluoride helps us to not get cavities. Right? It just happens, it's just happening in the background. It makes all of our cavities uh, less likely. It makes our dental health better. In the same way, we can think about, is there a way that we can create conditions, experiences, that would enable us all to have good relationships without really having to work too hard at it, right? Maybe an educational kind of program, that kind of thing. That's all primary prevention. We think of that as premarital counseling often uh, or enriching relationships that are already really good. And that's pretty common, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in our next class, okay? And we have to ask the question for all of these things, do these things work? Is that really possible, right? Does therapy really work? Do, pri do primary prevention programs actually reduce the likelihood of divorce? Do they actually make relationships healthier and stronger? So we'll talk about that today and on uh, Tuesday. Then in between the primary and tertiary kinds of intervention is a secondary intervention. And uh, this, I think, is underutilized, and I say that it's kind of rare, but I think it's an emerging kind of intervention. And the idea with secondary interventions is that they're, instead of giving something to everybody, that's primary prevention, instead of giving really intensive interventions to a few people who are really in distress, let's try to find ways that we can identify uh, risky times in people's lives, risky kinds of people, and then intervene with them. Like that's a, that might be a really efficient way of allocating our resources to helping the couples who are not yet in trouble, but who based on other research, again, that's the basic research really coming in to uh, affect how we think in smart ways about where to intervene, using that knowledge to say, oh, guess what? This could be a risky couple. How could we help that couple? Right? So that's secondary prevention, and that is intervening before something gets worse, right? That we sort of think that maybe there's a high likelihood, based on what we know about a couple or, say, the transition to parenthood, you know, a time in people's lives when uh, roles need to get renegotiated, when uh, uh, new stresses enter into the picture. You know, how can we be smart about identifying couples at risk? And a lot of the the, um, the modality, sort of the nature of these interventions actually looks sometimes like primary prevention, providing people with information. Uh, sometimes it looks like tertiary intervention, really looks like a couple's therapy. But the idea is to not really uh, focus on the couples when they're distressed, but to get them before they reach that point. So I want you to know those three kinds of uh, uh, prevention. And I want you to understand how they're different. And uh, today, I want to focus on uh, tertiary intervention, uh, which we usually we used to call marital therapy, but now it's really uh, couples therapy. So here's a cartoon. Uh, and it's uh, one couple talking to another couple. And uh, one of the people is saying, so the work being done in your marriage, are you having it done, or are you doing it yourself? As if they were renovating a bathroom in their house, right? And uh, by the way, I thought this was funny. Apparently you didn't. Um, uh, but let me tell you why it's funny. Uh, it's funny because all of us are maintaining our relationships all the time. All of us are doing work on our relationships all the time. And what you have to recognize, and if you have any interest in becoming a therapist or an attorney who works with people who are divorcing or a school teacher or any of the many uh, different kinds of occupations that will put you into contact with couples and families and children, um, 
what, one of the things you want to recognize is not how, when you're talking about couples therapy, how do you swoop in and magically change this situation? But you say, what have you guys already done? Like you guys already have been in this relationship for a long time. What have you done? What has gone well for you in the past? You've been together this amount of time. What's gone well for you and what changed, right? So the, usually one of the first questions that couples therapists ask or uh, different sets of questions that couples ask is tell me about the history of your relationship. Tell me about how you got together. Tell me about what was uh, attractive uh, uh, to you as partners when it was getting started. And then tell me what happened after that. And often people say things were going great and then we gradually sort of started working really hard on our jobs. The kids came. We didn't have enough time to pay attention to one another. Or maybe it was this one big event happened and we sort of lost, we, we really got into it with each other and it took us by surprise, that kind of thing. But the idea is couples are already all the time maintaining their relationship, just like you learned about in Chapter 7, right? That's happening all the time uh, uh, with varying degrees of success. And then when, when they show up at your doorstep, at you, the couple's therapist, for therapy, something has failed, right? Something that used to work is no longer working, and they have to, they have to sort of reevaluate where they are in their relationship. Sometimes they will come, and I'll say this in a moment, um, the presentations are highly varied. So the way that they present and the way that they arrive at your doorstep can be quite varied. Some people will, and in fact, if I have time today, I'll show you a video of a couple seeking uh, emotionally focused couples therapy that I want to show you. And um, they're not very distressed. They sort of said, that we see that this is an issue. It's coming up on the horizon. We want to address this now before it gets worse. It's almost like a secondary prevention sort of couple. But other couples will be really distressed and they'll be really on the brink of uh, making hard choices about whether they want their relationship. Maybe somebody had an affair. Maybe someone uh, uh, revealed that, all of the, that they had a lot of debts. Maybe someone, uh, uh, maybe someone uh, hurt the other person physically for the first time. And, uh, that changed the relationship. But the point is something is changing in the relationship to bring them to your doorstep. It can be a, any number of things, um, but part of your job as a couples therapist is to recognize that maintenance structures, processes that were able to sustain this couple for a long time, they've broken down a little bit. Something happened and now they're at your doorstep, right? So here's some general um, ideas about couples therapy, just some basic parameters of uh, how it tends to go and um, how it's structured. Uh, typically, it's one therapist with both partners. It re really is couples therapy. The focus is on both people being in the room. Usually, it's one therapist. Sometimes there's two therapists, co-therapists, they're called. Uh, that doubles the cost of the therapy, though, right? So now you've got two professionals in the room instead of just one. So it tends to go more toward a single therapist, but not always. Uh, and there are some advantages to that. You can um, match the gender, for example, of the couple and have that be reflected. If it's a straight couple, for example, you can have a male and a female in the couple and a male and a, male and a female therapist. And that can give you an opportunity to model the sorts of conversations that the couples might need to have. But typically, it's one therapist. Both partners typically show up most of the time. Doesn't mean that some of the, the, um, the clients or patients aren't seeing other therapists. That, that happens as well sometimes. Um, a typical course of therapy is 15 to 20 weekly sessions. Sometimes those sessions are 60 minutes long, 50 or 60 minutes long. Uh, more commonly, they're 90 minutes long because there's uh, often what you find in therapy is just when you get to uh, you know, uh, to a lot of the important material by the end of, you know, 40 or 45 minutes that it's time to end. So a lot of therapists, with, especially with two other people in the room, really want to have a 90-minute session. Therapists have many different kinds of diverse backgrounds. They can be um, clinical psychologists. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I learned how to do couples therapy. But you could have a master's degree in family therapy or an MFCC or you could have a background in social work. You could even be a, a psychiatrist. There are many different people. Uh, many, people with many different backgrounds can um, 
be available and be trained and have experience in this sort of, um, uh, in working with couples who are distressed or on the verge of becoming more distressed. At the sa I'm going to talk mostly about gener uh, generic kinds of interventions. So people who say, my relationship isn't going well, uh, we need help. And these are not going to be people who are coming in usually with highly specialized problems. So for example, there are other sorts of specialized interventions. For, there is a, a kind of sex therapy, for example. There are different kinds of sex therapy for people who really have sexual dysfunctions uh, and have to work that with, out within the context of couples. Most couples therapists are very familiar with dealing with sexual issues and sexual tension and sexual communication. But sometimes when that really is a very specialized focal problem, uh, that will get sent off to a, a sex therapist. Uh, sometimes, again, that happens in collaboration with uh, another kind of uh, more typical generic couples therapy. Um, so if there are high levels of domestic violence, often you have to sort of be really careful about how you coordinate that with couples therapy. Sometimes certain problems just have to be addressed and resolved, specific problems, before the couple's issues can really be confronted, right? So if one person is drinking a lot and that affects the relationship, well, couples therapy may not really help with that, but an intervention really devoted specifically to the drinking problem itself might be a kind of a, a prerequisite, getting that under control as a prerequisite to then moving into couples therapy or doing that simultaneously, right? So the point is that there is a sort of a, a typical generic form of couples therapy but at the same time, there are these more specialized forms of intervention that uh, are uh, uh, especially useful for specific kinds of couples. Yes? If you're um, like dealing with things like domestic violence, is there a certain like, level like you have to report it? You know? uh, yes, there are laws about reporting. So uh, therapists are obviously, uh, when you are um, a practitioner, you have a license. And part of that license, and that license is granted by the state that you're practicing in, say California. So you would be licensed MFCC or uh, uh, MFT or PhD in psychology or counseling psychology, whatever that would be. And part of the licensure requires you to understand the laws around um, around uh, domestic abuse, elder abuse, child abuse, for example. And so if there is a, uh, if either, per if there's a specific threat di directed at a specific person, uh, then you do have a duty to warn that individual. Uh, and what's interesting about that is, and that can happen not just with couples therapy, but even more with individual therapy, right? So uh, what's interesting about that is that most therapeutic interactions really are protected by patient-client confidentiality. That's part of the deal when you're uh, treating someone in therapy. And um, in fact, it is often what makes the therapeutic encounter special and important is that uh, the things that you as a therapist hear are not going to be disclosing to other people outside that room, right? And that's uh, part of the understanding. That gets complicated when people say, actually, I, and this never happens, uh, actually, I sort of once thought about killing my mother-in-law, right? Like, oh, let's talk about that. Right now, if that's really true, if there's a specific threat directed at a specific person, then uh, uh, I, as a therapist, have a duty to warn that person. Guess what? The deal we had about confidentiality, I have to break that deal because this is a life or death matter now. So you absolutely have to uh, report, and if, you, if and when you become a licensed therapist, you'll go through all of those uh, legal issues. Um, there is uh, another interesting aspect of that, which is if you're doing psychotherapy therapy with an individual, uh, that's your client, right? That's your individual. That's who you're, you're answering to. That's who's footing the bill. When a couple comes in the room, uh, now you've got two people, and uh, some therapists... Um, uh, will, uh, let, let's say uh, you're doing therapy and uh, you have a couple and they're kind of distressed and as it turns out the wife is a high-powered business person and you see them Wednesday night at six o'clock but this Wednesday the wife's out of town. The guy says well I'm paying for this session anyway and it's been really productive so I want to come and come and talk to you about how things are going in my life. You're my therapist. And the therapist says Oh, by the way, I'm having an affair with my secretary, by the way. Uh, and this, my partner doesn't know about. So would you be willing to not tell my partner this? Whoa. 
So now you have to be very clear about where the boundaries are and who your allegiance is to. And good therapists, most therapists, really get that worked out long before that incident occurs, right? So part of what happens early on in the course of your therapy is saying, this is how this works. Like these are sort of the ground rules of how this works. So if either of you tells me something in private, maybe, you know, it depends on the therapist's perspective on this, that's part of something that everybody knows. Like I am not going to withhold information from either of you if either of you tell me. So don't tell me anything in private that you don't want me to tell your partner, right? So you, you, you know, good therapists don't get surprised by the affair that um, the guy is having. Um, so there's a lot of interesting issues about confidentiality, who your client is, who you're, uh, who you're answerable to, and those issues are uh, interesting and important, uh, and they're not just a characteristic of couples therapy, they're also going to be true of the 15-year-old kid who comes in and says, I'm a little suicidal, but my parents don't know that. And you have to be really clear on who your client is and what the arrangement is, and uh, you could imagine if you were the child, you might not want your parents to know that. And if you were the parents, you would certainly want to know that. So you get into all these kinds of interesting issues. And that's really what you learn about when you get, uh, one of the key things that you learn about when you get into a, um, uh, a counseling program is not just how to fix people and how to work with people and how to help people improve their own circumstances, but how do you sort of structure the relationship so that it becomes really productive and so you avoid sort of the, uh, the, the bumps along the road that uh, are probably inevitable. Anyway, back to couples therapy. Uh, there are these specialized interventions uh, and uh, people will often refer somebody to these interventions. And as I was mentioning earlier, couples seek help for a wide range of problems at different stages in their relationship and they often wait a long time to seek your help. Right? So they don't come in right after the first little squabble. Like That's not happening. They come in long after the first squabble and even after, so even after um, many years of a certain problem, you know, things will have been okay and then they deteriorate some and then they get a little bit better, but then something happens and it brings them into counseling, right? So I got this job offer to move to uh, Austin, Texas, and things haven't been going so well with my partner and I, and she happened to casually mention that she really loves her job and wants to stay in Los Angeles with the kids, and the kids' school situation is going well, so we have a dilemma. We have a problem. Things haven't been great, but now this is an acute issue that has to get resolved. So you as a therapist often don't just have to address the problem that brought them in the room, which is, oh, we have to make a decision about whether or not I'm going to move to Austin, Texas with or without my partner. We don't just have to make that decision. We don't have to just sort of work through those issues. We have to work through everything that got us up to this point that made that even a possibility, right? So couples therapists uh, have to do a lot of things. Sometimes they have to work on the most acute issue and often will have to solve that problem if it has a certain uh, deadline associated with it. But uh, in the course of doing that, it's very, very common that you then say, okay, how did we get here that this was even an issue? How, what, what, were the, what were the issues that sort of led you to grow apart originally? Let's get back to that, and at the same time, let's try to resolve this more acute, imminent issue that you're, you're facing. So why do people seek therapy? Um, you probably aren't surprised by a lot of this, uh, the, this list, a lot of the items on this list. Couples say that, oh, this is what uh, therapists say, by the way. Uh, therapists say that couples come in, uh, no surprise, uh, we're not communicating well. The couples in front of me are not communicating well. Uh, that is often a consequence of being very unhappy with your partner. Power struggles, like this person is trying to do this, this person wants to do this, they can't really agree on who gets to make decisions, so they uh, often, uh, as we talked about in the cognition literature, uh, the cognition lecture, uh, people will often say, you know, this is my point of view, I, I can't really see your point of view anymore, and I want my point of view to be the one that's going to matter here. Why am I all the, always the one making sacrifices? That shouldn't be, that's not really fair. Uh, other things that therapists say, and these are the uh, percentages of, I think, therapists who say that. 
uh, these things. Uh, and the items in bold here are especially common and uh, also difficult to treat. Uh, it's hard to treat an unrealistic expectation, right? That's, it's not a behavior that needs to change. It's a way of thinking about um, uh, what you, how somebody came into the relationship, what they were hoping to get in the relationship, and the disappointment that they might be feeling given that that, uh, that ideal that they have hasn't been met. Other things that come up that happen all the time, uh, uh, sex isn't going so well, we're not solving our problems, uh, we disagree on how to show affection, there's not enough affection, uh, we argue over money, we just don't love each other that much anymore, so what can we do? We still have kids. Uh, kids are an issue, and serious personal issues, right? So um, the, um, as we learned about in the individual differences lecture, um, personality traits matter, right? So it has to, personality traits sort of, you know, whether you're argumentative, whether you're prone to depression, whether you have low self-esteem, whether you're sort of an impulsive kind of person, if those are factors that we believe are going to generate distress, are going to increase the likelihood that a couple is going to struggle, then there's going to be a disproportionate number of the people who come to see you for therapy who have those issues, right? So couples therapy isn't cut off from the individual. A lot of what you're trying to do is work with this system, understand the interdependencies that exist within the couple system, right? But at the same time, you cannot ignore who those individuals are. And part of what might be bringing them into the room is not just strictly a communication issue, but who they are as individuals and how they communicate in general with other people and uh, the, the rest of the world, right? So um, you do see uh, people who have issues that go well beyond the relationship, right? The problems in the relationship aren't separate from the problems and the struggles of the individual uh, uh, clients themselves. And that's why a good therapist can sort of navigate both worlds, right? It's not just that I'm understanding this couple as a couple, but I'm understanding who these individuals are as individuals and their stresses and strains and how they respond to them, their unique styles of responding to these problems and how their personalities figure into that. And then I sort of put those two people back together into the dyad and understand how those, that combination of personalities may be fueling some of the issues that this couple is bringing into the room for you to deal with right now. So serious person is personal issues do show up. Um, I think I may have mentioned that relationship problems, this is more of a chapter one issue, that relationship problems are really one of the uh, leading reasons why anybody seeks counseling in the United States. Sometimes it's the relationship showing up for therapy. Sometimes it's individuals showing up for therapy saying, I'm not happy with the way my relationships have gone. But one way or another, if you're going to become a therapist or an attorney, you're going to really be dealing with these kinds of issues. And um, uh, they're out there, and uh, there is really a need for uh, not just therapists who are sort of good and passionate about it, but who really sort of pay attention to what the scientific literature says about what tends to work. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Another thing on that, maybe I said this also early in the class. Does anybody know where most, um, who does the most couples therapy? Uh, who, what kinds of individuals in the community do the most kind of couples therapy? Just anyone. Parents? Parents? Uh, there's a lot of informal counseling that happens. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, pastors? Pastors, yeah. So if you want to be a therapist, you should really become a member of the clergy. Um, <laughs> it turns out, or if you are already a member of the clergy, and I've had people in the past in this class who have been members of the clergy, uh, you will see a lot of people wanting to come and talk with you about what's going on in their lives, and those will be family and relation stresses and strains, right? So what is, uh, there's no typical case, but if there were a typical case, uh, it would sound a little bit like this. This is the case that, you know, if you're going to be a physician, this is the common cold. This is the thing you're going to see. If you're going to be a psychiatrist, it's going to be depression and anxiety. Those are the things you're going to see. If you're going to be a couples therapist, it's going to sound a little bit like this with some interesting varieties around it. 
and uh, I have it as a heterosexual couple, but it need not be. Uh, one person who I've labeled Jill says, you know, I'm not getting enough closeness from Jack. And uh, I need more, more from him around the house and with the kids. I'm sort of feeling burdened by all the stuff that I do. I have a, at least a part-time job, and then I come home and I have to work with the kids. And I, you know, I'm doing so much, and it feels like a burden. And uh, she says, so why are you so insensitive and selfish? Why are you pushing me away all the time? Jack says, I think we're close enough, but the problem is we're not physically intimate enough. That used to be true in our relationship. It's not true in our relationship anymore. And you're trying to sort of tell me what to do all the time. I want to help out with the kids, but I always have to do it on your terms and on your schedule and in your way. And I don't like that. You're pushing me around. So I actually need not closeness. I need a little distance. I need a little autonomy. I need a little respect. And I need you to sort of recognize that when I am working, when I'm not in the house, I'm actually working. I'm the one who's really bringing home all the money in this relationship. So somehow that doesn't seem to matter. When I get home, the first thing you tell me is, you know, I've, I've got 20 things to do. Like you've been sort of storing these up all day and then you just drop that on me without even saying how my day was or whether I even have time to manage these things. So why do you nag me all the time? That's what I want to know. And why do you keep ignoring the fact that I have sexual needs? Don't you get that? Wasn't that part of the way our relationship got together in the first place? Wasn't that part of what was good about our relationship? So you'll hear this, some version of it, you know, lots and lots and lots. Like, uh, we're negotiating closeness here. A lot of what people are doing when they come in for therapy are saying, how do we regulate our closeness now? How do we regulate intimacy? And how do we regulate and make sense of and adapt to, A, the fact that we're no longer the 27-year-olds we were when we got married? So how do we make sense of the idea that relationships change? And second, how do we make sense of the fact that the circumstances around us have changed? That we really do have a beautiful house, and that's great, but now we really have to work harder to pay the bills. We have kids now, and that's great, but also Johnny, he's a little bit of a troublemaker, and he did that thing at school, and he keeps getting into trouble. How do we sort of make sense of that? How do we deal with all these circumstances? So this is what a therapist is going to be uh, uh, confronting. And when two people show up in the room and they say, you know, we, we're stuck. We've tried everything we can try. The things that we used to do aren't working anymore. We took a vacation. We thought it would be great. We thought it would sort of restore things. And it did a little bit, but then we started arguing again. It, you know, it's a deeper problem than that. So both people feel misunderstood, almost always. Like, don't you get it? Don't you understand my point of view? And both people are saying that. Both of them feel like, I don't have the options that I need here. I, I, I've tried, and people really genuinely do believe that. Both people feel like they're not getting the uh, appreciation that they used to get from their partner. Uh, they're not being uh, loved for who they are. And they're a little uh, pessimistic about where the relationship is going to go. Like, seriously, this is a problem. I, for the first time, I'm starting to contemplate the possibility of maybe me moving out. Like, maybe this just isn't right. And I know that's a terrible thing to do. I know it's not the greatest thing for our kids, but... You know, I've got coworkers who did it, and it was really, really hard at first, but somehow they managed. And I don't want to do that. I'm not saying that because it's a threat, but I'm thinking about it because every day I'm miserable. And every day she's miserable. So please, could you help us? They both want to invest the time and the money. They, they have the resources. This matters to them. And... They don't want to do that unless it's really going to improve their circumstances, right? Um, if you or any of your friends need couples therapy, one of the things you want to be really good about is um, evaluating your therapist, right? Therapists, I've already said, differ really widely in how they're going to approach the game. And in a minute... I'll tell you about some of the key targets in couples therapy. 
Um, but part of your job, if you or your friends or anybody you know says, so you took that relationships class, how does couples therapy work? Well, here's how it works. Find a therapist that you both like, right? Find a therapist who, after you've sort of interviewed them and checked them out, that you sort of say, yeah, that seems like the kind of thing we need, right? So, you know, when you go to see a therapist, you're not just handing them the keys to your marriage, right? You're sort of saying, tell me what you got. Tell me what works. Tell me what your orientation is. Tell me what your philosophy is. Here's our issue. You know, we can tell you about us and what's going on in an hour. We can tell you through that. We can take you through that. But tell me not just what you're going to do right now, but what the point is, what the philosophy is, what your strategy is going to be, right? And at the same time, how long is this going to take? Like, in your experience, how long will this take? And, uh, you know, the, the, best, uh, couples, uh, the best couples, even though they're in a state of heightened distress, are the ones who, even in the midst of that heightened distress, don't just go to the first therapist that they check into, right? They find the one that's really going to work for them. It's sort of like uh, finding a tailor. It's sort of like finding someone who's going to, oh, let, I, I understand you. I think I get you. And here's how I would proceed with you and a wardrobe. Like this, I think, is what would work for you. So there are different kinds of therapists. And they differ in, kinds of, in terms of their training. They differ in terms of their experience. They differ in terms of sort of their personality and style. Some therapists are really sort of charge in, take charge, and muck around with things and change things from the very start. Other therapists are going to sit back and uh, try to learn a lot more from you before they make any rec recommendations or see how you can come up with recommendations on your own. So anyway, there are lots of kinds of therapists, but one of the things I want you to know is that there's different theoretical orientations, okay? Different theoretical orientations. You'll see a question or two about these orientations on the, um, on the midterm. Now, I'm going to basically start telling you about different flavors of intervention. Okay? I'm also going to tell you that the latter two have been studied a lot more. Okay? So that question that I asked earlier, does this work? We don't know that. We actually don't know the answer for that for all interventions. We know it more for some than others, and it tends to be those latter two, the behavioral ones and the emotional ones. There's complicated reasons for that. I get into it a, a little bit in the book. Um, but uh, it's important to recognize that n our knowledge base on these interventions is not uniform. Okay? We know more about some than others. Another thing you should know about couples therapists is that very few people would say, oh, I'm just, I'm just that one. I'm number two. I'm a systems person. Like, that's my thing. Most people would say, I was trained in this orientation. That's what I know best. Like, I use the latter two models the most. But there are times when I do the other things as well, right? So there is, um, there is value when you're a therapist to not saying, oh, I only do this one thing. Whoever comes in my room, this is what I sort of hit them over the head with, right? It's like saying, this is where I start, this is my general orientation, but I'm not opposed, I know about these other ideas, right? So um, most therapists describe themselves as eclectic, you know, able to choose from different kinds of perspectives and different kinds of models. Um, so when I outline these four distinct approaches, they're distinct theoretically, but they're not distinct when you go out into the population. If you were to, you know, call 20 therapists and say, so, you know, which of these four, all 20 of them would say, actually, none of those four. I don't, I do some of those things, but I'm eclectic. I use whatever I need to use to make progress with whatever the couple is um, struggling with. But still, you want to know these four different uh, uh, approaches, these four different theoretical starting points. And the first one are psychodynamic models. And uh, here, you might uh, associate with this with Freud, and it does actually have its long-term distant roots in a Freudian sort of approach. But a lot of that approach has been the, sort of the classic psychodynamic approach, 
uh, well, actually it was that classic psychoanalytic approach is what we associate with Freud. It's actually now been sort of reduced to a psychodynamic approach, similar in flavor, but the basic idea, it, you know, it's not two, couple, two people in a couple each sitting on a couch with a, th with a therapist, you know, asking them to free associate. It's not how that works. But there is still a focus on unconscious processes. Like there are things about you, uh, ways that you're perceiving one another that you don't even recognize that probably have a lot to do with how your parents treated you, okay? So, uh, and because you sort of see each other through this hazy curtain of an unconscious process, uh, uh, you have certain emotional reactions. You're not really sort of interacting with one another as authentic beings. And so psychodynamic approaches are designed to say, why do you see your partner in this way? Like, what's going on with that? That's different from a systems model, which is where, um, and, and I should say about the psychodynamic approach, the history matters, right? Your history really matters. That's a, that is, I think, a fair, true statement about a psycho, certainly psychoanalytic and a psychodynamic perspective is that something about you and your, uh, your prior relationships really matters. It's no surprise that John Bowlby, our friend, the attachment theorist, was really influenced by the psychodynamic folks, right? So that same idea that your attachment history today, the way you proceed into relationships with other people right now, is really related, linked back to the interactions you had with a caregiver. Uh, it's no surprise that that idea really sprung from uh, psychiatry in London circa 1950. Okay, so psychodynamic models really about unconscious perceptions that really have these roots in your other relationships, almost always relationships with your parents and family members, other important people in your life when you were growing up. Systems model, by contrast, really doesn't talk about the past so much. It just says relationships, people enact and follow rules in their relationship. They may not seem like rules. They're not rules like you know, how to uh, drive on the 405. It's not that kind of rule. But people sort of work out adaptations to how they're going to respond to certain systems, certain circumstances in their lives. And when those rules don't operate well anymore, symptoms arise and problems arise, and people then come in and they need help. And the idea isn't, oh, let's go all the way back to your childhood and find out why you have those rules. The idea is to say, what do you have right now that you're dealing with? What's the rule that you guys keep, that you don't understand, you keep stumbling over? And uh, so the idea is to identify and change the unstated rules that are guiding undesi undesirable behaviors. So it's more in the present than a psychodynamic point of view. Behavioral models are much more about changing what's happening. So a behavioral model really sort of uh, uh, you will recognize as having clear linkages back to social learning theory, uh, that we sort of engage in these coercive processes, right, that have gotten us into trouble. We're not engaging in enough positive sorts of interactions. And when we argue, I raise my voice, and you end up sort of, uh, I end up getting my way, and you go off and feel bad about yourself, and I feel bad about myself. But I actually been inadvertently rewarded for having just won that argument by yelling at you. Uh, that sort of coercive thing. So the behavioral models, which have been around, really emerged in the uh, late 1960s when the divorce rate in the U.S. was particularly high. Uh, the idea is, well, let's change the way you guys are coordinating your behaviors. Let's change that right now. And that's not untrue of the other two models. It's just really the focus and the emphasis of the behavioral model. Behavioral model uh, eventually expanded a little bit to also include not just the communication that you guys engage in, but also interpretations, right? So how, how are you making sense of it? Much like the, uh, the, the attribution sorts of ideas, the, the idea that there's an unrealistic expectation 
can sort of sound like a cognitive process, right? Like, oh, you're expecting this, and I give you this, so you're disappointed. So how can we change your expectation for what happens in a relationship? Emotion models are um, uh, the idea that emotion would be a salient consideration in couples therapy almost goes without saying. Because in the psychodynamic model, it's this idea that uh, how you've been treated in the past uh, might be part of an explanation of why you get angry in certain situations currently in your relationship, right? The idea that a systems model, when things go awry, when the rules sort of start breaking down for you, that will evoke an emotional reaction. Frustration, sadness, pain, something, right? That's gonna, it's got to hurt somehow. Um, uh, behavioral models, you know, the idea that you're not having enough positive emotion. Emotion is sort of riddled throughout all of these models, but it comes to the fore. It becomes the most salient issue for these emotion-focused therapies where the idea is to get people to encourage the expression of core emotions in their relationship to sort of explicitly recognize that this a relationship is an affective, emotionally charged endeavor, and that what you have to do is understand and uh, gain some control and understanding and mastery within the dyad of those emotional processes, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, today, I hope, or if we need to, uh, next week. And so what you're in the business of doing is getting people not just to uh, express core emotions, but also to uh, uh, recognize, it's not just the expression, but uh, that there's a recognition of those emotional experiences within the couple and that people are um, uh, uh, healthy and responsive uh, in how they uh, relate to one another. So there's a sense in which distressed couples, and I hope you saw this in Chapter 8, are um, there is a, a, a structure to our conversations when we're distressed, right? There's a sense that, and we saw this in the uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, um, Bruce Willis video, right? That there's sort of a structure, uh, uh, almost as though once the argument starts, it's hard to get it back uh, into any uh, healthier kind of place. There's a, kind of a script. If you've been in an unhappy relationship, you know that there's a script, and you get to the end of the argument, you say, what were we arguing about? Like, why, how did we get there? And it's almost as though you can't extricate yourself from the sort of the quicksand of your own arguments. And um, the idea with uh, emotion models is to really get people to reevaluate that and to be less um, reactive, less uh, stimulus bound. So that just because your partner said uh, something bad about you doesn't mean, and just because you feel angry, doesn't mean you have to lash out at your partner, right? You, you actually have some options, some choices about how you express your emotion. So let me, I think I've said most of these other parts. Um, so the psychodynamic models, and you know, I've already sort of outlined the basic foci and emphases within these models. Let me now talk a little bit more about what they try to accomplish. I think I've said this, but just to reiterate, psychodynamic models, like how can we pull those, how can we understand those unconscious perceptions that are getting in the way, those clouded perceptions, and build more authentic relationships so that I'm treating you in an authentic way and you're treating me in an authentic way. Can anyone see a problem with that, with that approach? Like you're trying to like say, okay, I'm, treati I'm not treating you, oh, and we saw this in Nadine and Frank, right? She's scary just like my mom. So like she's, it's really scary how similar Nadine is to my mother. Oh, okay, that sounds like a, psych a psychodynamic statement, right? So, you know, even uh, in their relationship did struggle a little bit. Uh, the idea would be uh, we can help a person like that say, do you realize that when you respond to Nadine, you're not being fair to her. You need to respond to her in the way that she is, not the way that you want her to be based on your relationship with your own mother, right? The problem is sometimes... You can create authentic uh, relationships. It doesn't make them better, right? So if often from a psychodynamic point of view, one of the complicated things that we're really struggling with right now in studying in couples therapy is that maybe divorce is a good outcome. Maybe that's actually better for everybody involved if the couple ends their relationship, right? So uh, from a psychodynamic model, people really explicitly say that, that maybe that's okay. 
maybe the authenticity is really such that when they discover who they are and who their partner is, they realize they got into this relationship for the wrong reasons, and this is not a good relationship for them, so maybe it has to end. Systems model, the idea is, how do you help couples see that the problem is in the rules and their solutions, not in one another? So with a systems model, the idea is the problem is not the problem, right? The problem reflects a breakdown of uh, uh, rules within the relationship, and those are the problems that you have to go after. The so, uh, one of the things that systems here say is, the problem isn't the problem, the solution is the problem, right? So the solution that you've been trying to use in this situation has been getting you into trouble. That's the problem. So let's get some new solutions. You've solved the problem and prem premised on some bad rules. Let's get a better set of rules in front of you and let's try to understand those. So you help them to see that it's the solutions that they're using, not uh, blaming each other for the problem. Uh, behavioral models, as I've said, really the goal is how do you get people to communicate better? How do you communicate way in ways that say, I understand what you're saying, I hear what you're saying, it's really much more mechanical, much more how do you communicate well and effectively in relationships? How do you take all of the emotion that you might be experiencing and instead of really uh, collapsing under the weight of all that negative emotion, how do you sort of reorganize the communication in such a way that you guys are respectful toward one another? You're really finding ways to generate positive experiences that as we learned about in chapter seven, maybe have fallen by the wayside a little bit in your relationship. How do you um, uh, learn to not um, criticize your partner in such harsh terms, right? How do you soften uh, the way that you talk to your partner? That's the behavioral model, real simple, behave differently. The emotion models, and there's also a problem with this model, by the way, which is, uh, here's, here's one thing a couple once said to me, uh, thanks for the treatment, that was really effective. I think we're communicating really well with each other, and we've discovered that we don't like each other. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, and we are uh, looking for new partners right now. Um, so that can happen. Uh, uh, emotion models are designed to help couples see that their relationship is a safe place. Sounds like attachment theory, right? Their relationship is a safe place where they can really express their deeper feelings. They can sort of get back to that intimacy process sort of idea. This is hard for me. This makes me sad. This makes me feel weak. This makes me feel inadequate. And to not have the partner say, well, it's your own fault. Well, guess what? The world's a hard place. Instead, they, you have a partner who says, yeah, and I can help you with that. I can connect with you around that. You're expressing vulnerabilities and I'm here to listen to those just like you're here to, express, to, to listen to my vulnerabilities, right? So it's um, uh, expressing deeper feelings and to the extent that there is sort of a, a historical element to the emotion models, and there is, to overcome um, the history in the, uh, the relationship. So let's talk a little bit about this, uh, the uh, tested therapies. So there is, uh, as I've indicated, it was really the last two kinds of models that people know the most about, the behavioral models and the uh, emotion-focused models. And the reasons are kind of interesting. Lots of it comes down to uh, whether it's possible to create manuals to give to therapists that you can then study in a, a quasi-laboratory kind of situation. It has to do with what you're trying to measure to understand whether the intervention is working. We can measure behavioral processes pretty well. We can measure emotion processes reasonably well. So a lot of what's been tested uh, are in those last two categories. And I want to sort of uh, make some distinctions here. The last one is uh, emotionally focused couples therapy, OK? Um, a lot like the last category on the previous slide, the emotion focused models. The other three are more behavioral. Uh, the first one is really behavioral, and that's called traditional behavioral couples therapy. That is really more of a mechanical approach to changing couples' conversations, okay? That's TBCT, traditional behavioral couples therapy. Neil Jacobson and Gail Margolin uh, came up with that in uh, 1979. Uh, we talked about that when we were talking about social learning theory, okay? That's that idea. How do we... Uh, your past doesn't matter. What really matters is us getting, me getting you to communicate 
more effectively, right? To put some structure around this communication that has been getting you into trouble. And to sort of teach you some skills about how to communicate. And that we think about is sort of the standard. So that works, and I'll give you a, a slide in a minute, that works pretty well. Turns out that works pretty well. Uh, and as a result, all new studies, all new interventions are usually judged in relation to that. Right? So if that's the one that works pretty well, now we're in the business of saying, OK, what works better? That works pretty well. Can we improve on that? And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, a variant of that is cognitive behavioral couples therapy. That's really not just changing how people talk with one another, but also in attributional processes and cognitions, just what it says. And then there's a kind of integrative behavioral couples therapy that I'm going to talk about uh, today, if time permits, which is really interesting. And I've got it here toward the bottom of the slide because it really starts to shade into emotional focused couples therapy. It has much more of an emotional tone to it. And the idea is, and yet it's still behavioral. The idea is change what you can change. If you're a therapist, change what you can change. But learn to accept what you can't change, right? So often what happens in, not often, but it's not uncommon in the course of couples therapy to say, well, we communicate better, and I asked him to change these things. These were hard things for him to change. These are hard things for me to change. It's part of who I am. And I kind of like those parts of me. So the therapy at that point says, oh, maybe instead of trying to change those things, that you as relationship partners have to accept those things about your partner. So you should accept what you already have, not try to change it. So that is a, an emerging model. That's the integrative behavioral couples therapy. Okay? It's important for you to understand that, which you know, historically we've said, oh, your relationship is unhappy. Uh, I think you don't communicate well, and goodness knows my looking at you and listening to you suggests that you guys can't communicate for nothing, so I'm going to fix that, right? And we did a lot of studies, and we said, oh, let's try to change behavior. Let's increase positives, decrease negatives, and make you uh, sort of uh, uh, have a better relationship, have the better relationship that you've always wanted to have. That's worked, but it hits the ceiling. It hasn't gotten us to really be able to help everybody. And so those people, and my colleague here at UCLA, Andy Christensen, uh, developed an intervention that said, that just doesn't make sense. At some point, you want to do all of that. But at another point, you want to say, that's sort of who he is. You're going to have to accept part of that. You don't have a line item veto when it comes to your partner. You can't just take all the good stuff and then say, just change these three things, and then you'd be perfect. right? You have to say, I love all these things about you. I don't love all these other things about you, but I accept those things. It might be hard for me, but I can do it. And I hope you'll do the same, right? So you can see how that's really different from just a change, change, change behavior model. It's change, 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 and then what you can't change, if you can, learn to accept it. We're not talking about accepting really bad things. We're not accepting, uh, you know, talking about accepting physical abuse. We're just sort of learning to tolerate things that we don't like. Uh, within the realm of our imperfectness. So what do we know about TBCT? I've got these big gears here, these big sort of grinding gears to convey this idea that TBCT is really about restructuring the mechanism of communication, right? So we know, you know, from basic research that reinforcements erode over time, right? I talked about that in the relationship maintenance chapter that the positives tend to fall by the wayside in our relationships. We don't invest as much, or, let me say, early in our relationships, it comes easy, spending time together, but we get used to it, right? And so what happens is things that used to be rewarding in our relationship, we don't sort of find them as rewarding as we once did. And because of that, the idea is we want to get people to restore their positive interactions. So part of what a traditional, that's up in the right-hand corner here, the TBCT approach is to say, let's get back to the, the good things that were in your relationship to begin with. Let's get those things back in place. And maybe you need to change them. You've got kids now, and that might change how you do these things. But look, 
This is your marriage. This is your relationship. You got to do nice stuff. You got to do things that make you feel happy, make you uh, relaxed and comfortable with, with each other. You got to do this stuff. Maybe you have to have a date night every night, uh, every night, uh, every week, right? Maybe you need to get it. Maybe you need to hire a babysitter, right? Get out of the house. Take some of the pressure off yourself. Get some time together. And don't argue. Just enjoy the time, okay? So that's the uh, sort of restoring positive interactions. We also know that there are these coercive cycles in relationships, right? So we get into these back and forth negative exchanges. We get sort of sunk in that deep muck of negative reciprocity. You say something mean to me, I nat naturally want to defend and justify my point of view, so I do that and I say something mean to you, and off that goes until one of us quits, right? So uh, those are coercive cycles, and as a result, uh, because those, th those, those behavioral patterns exist, what we need to do is train people in basic community communication skills, like trying to understand your point of view, or your partner's point of view, trying to listen for what they're saying, and maybe even for some of the things that they're not saying, but they're hinting at, validating them when they do express their point of view, and expressing negative feelings in a really effective way. It's not to say get rid of negativity, it's a way of saying, how can you be productive with your negativity, right? But again, all of this is just mechan the mechanical processes of communication. That's the traditional behavioral couples therapy approach. And problem solving as well. Uh, granted, you have problems, uh, you have issues that you need to resolve. But now we have to take those communication skills and use those as a foundation for now attacking the problems that seem to be dividing you. So let's have you engage in XYZ statements. An XYZ statement is, uh, I feel this way when you do this in this situation, right? So that's an XYZ statement. Uh, uh, and so what that does is it doesn't say, why do you always do it this way? It's saying, here's how I'm seeing that, right? And that sort of takes a lot of the heat out of the conversation. Uh, you get people to define the problem rather than just assume that they know what the problem is. You get people to brainstorm solutions instead of always insisting on their approach or not being as creative as they might be. And you get people to try to be effective in how they resolve problems, right? So a lot of this is oriented toward communicating better and solving problems, the problems that brought the couples into the room in the first place. Okay. So let's just only look at the red bars here, okay? Just the red bars. Traditional behavioral couples therapy works pretty well. So when we do a couples therapy study, and this is work, again, by my colleague here at UCLA, Andy Christensen, um, you can uh, do a course of therapy for any given couple, and at the end of the therapy, you can assign them to one of four categories. You can say, they actually got worse. That's deterioration. They actually got worse. Their satisfaction score went down, or they came in saying they didn't want to get divorced, and they divorced, right? So you can see that, uh, and now the red bars are the two-year data and the five-year data, right? So you can see that about, I'm, I'll only talk about the five-year data, just for simplicity, but you can see that big red bar at the bottom. That's like 40% of the people who get traditional behavioral couples therapy. People who have real problems and who are the br on the brink of ending their relationship. This is tertiary care, right? Uh, about 40% of them actually deteriorate. Uh, another 10 or 15% or so uh, don't change at all. They get 20 weeks of therapy and it doesn't have much of an effect on them. The other two groups you can see there are the recovered and the improved groups. If you recover, there's a distinction here and I want you to know it. If you recover, it means you look a lot like the happy, happy couples that are out in the community. You actually achieve a level of satisfaction that makes you indistinguishable from other couples who are happy in their relationships out in the world. Improved people are between the no change and the recover group. They improved, they actually, they became happier, but it doesn't mean they're the happiest couples out there, right? So they got better. And so what you do is you sort of add those two big red bars. The one on the top is right around 30% maybe after five years. The one in the improved category gets you another 15%. So maybe 35% plus 15% ballpark. You're looking at half of the couples who get TBCT tend to either recover or improve. And the other half don't change or deteriorate. Okay? So that's how that works. 
Not bad. Not bad for couples who are really struggling in their relationship. In this particular study, this is one study, these couples were really unhappy in their relationship. So by all of the self-report indices that we've been able to, to use, we can document that these couples are struggling. So how can we, the question then becomes, how do we improve on that? And there are a couple strategies. One is uh, called unified detachment. And with unified detachment, what you try to do is help couples to step back from their own patterns and see their behavior in a less emotional way. You try to get them in a, in a sense to be more analytical. Like, okay, what's going on here? Let, you guys have to be, get outside of sort of the emotional immediacy of the moment of your conflicts. Get outside of them and try to have an understanding of what's going on. Not just your own point of view, but really at the dyadic system level, okay? So the therapist will offer a theme that captures both partners' perspectives, for example, but presents it in a neutral way. So Betty, you tend to be more like an artist. Like you like creativity, you see all the different possibilities that exist, but Betty, uh, but Joan, you tend to be more like the scientist. You're the one who really wants an answer to things and you're really concrete about things. And it's great to be an artist, it's great to be a scientist, but somehow you guys are gonna have to work out those two points of view, right? That's how you guys approach the world. So how can you sort of work that out together? How's that gonna work for you? How can you integrate these two really valuable points of view and have them both work to your advantage in the relationship rather than become a disadvantage, right? So that's a kind of a theme. And then the therapist, every time it comes out, the therapist says, oh, Betty, there you are being the artist, right? I see that, I see that. But, uh, but uh, Joan, do you see that? That this is her wanting to be creative, not wanting to be constrained, not wanting to have to follow the rule. And Joan says, oh yeah, there it is. There's our pattern, I see it. And then you want to uh, help people to say, oh, that's the way we coordinate. That's our flavor of our interdependence. That's the way we dance with one another. That's our thing. And I see it, I understand it, and I can get outside of it. And that's just our pattern, and I can learn to say, that's okay. I see that happening. I don't need to get mad at Betty because she's an artist. It's kind of interesting even. And then, if possible, you can sort of link that back to where, that, where those artist-scientist sorts of ideas came from. Artist-scientist, one of many examples. I was just throwing that as one example. So that's the first strategy that people sort of put in place for getting moving on uh, a better version, a better approach to... Uh, um, uh, moving beyond the, the promising results, those 50% or so results for traditional behavioral couples therapy. Another approach is uh, uh, empathic joining. And so here the idea is to get people, and this is also true of emotion-focused ther therapy, this is where they start to converge, um, is getting part partners to express their emotions and instead of dividing because of that, because of their affective uh, experiences to find ways to join around their emotion. So uh, here's an idea that's powerful and that I want you to know about, which is that when somebody is angry, usually, uh, we think of that as a secondary emotion. And anger is divisive, right? So if I were to say something critical to you, you'd say something critical right back to me, or you, you would think less of me because I said that. But if I had that feeling of anger, and instead of, instead of expressing that, I said, I guess I just feel hurt sometimes. Like I, just, I, you know, I, I feel kind of weak sometimes. And I think I express that as anger. You would say, oh, gee, how can I understand? How, that's not good that you feel weak or sad. Like, that's not good. How can I, how can I get behind that? Like, how can I support you so you feel stronger. So the key is to sort of not, uh, is to recognize that the anger is often sort of protection. And it's protecting something which is inadequacy, right? So uh, th this approach and uh, emotion focused therapy as well says, how do we get beyond those hard feelings, the hard outer shell of anger that's pushing you away, me pushing you away with anger? How do you um, get to the vulnerable feelings the therapist then says, wow, that, that sounds rough. Feeling sad like that all the time? Walking around feeling inadequate? 
walking around feeling like you're just not as good as other people. That sounds rough. And then to uh, have those be experiences within the relationship that people can say, oh, let's get together around those. Let me support you. Let me, what I need to hear is not your anger. I need to hear your vulnerability. And when I hear your vulnerability, I can sort of, I, I don't feel like I need to defend myself. I can be with you with those feelings and try to make you feel better. And guess what? If I make you feel better, that's going to make our relationship better. And then we can reciprocate those sorts of experiences. So both of these techniques are designed beyond the, the TBCT approach to get to the deeper issues, not just how, the mechanics of how we communicate, but to get to the depth of your emotional experiences and then emphasize, oh, how can I accept that? I don't want to just change this about you. I don't need to change your communication so you're not angry. What I need to do is accept the fact that sometimes you are angry or you have angry feelings, but that I can look through that and see that you're struggling. And if I can see that you're struggling, then I naturally I'll be more inclined to help you. Right? So that's the, the, the TBCT model is just these mechanical approaches this is more about depth. This is about getting to acceptance rather than change, as I mentioned earlier. Got just a few minutes left. Let me just show you this one slide. So same slide, right? And the, the red bars are the TBCT bars, the mechanical approach. Okay? The, re the uh, blue bars are within the same study this is now the IBCT approach, okay? This is the more, let's change what we can change and accept what we can't change. This is with those two new modifications in place. Like, how can we improve TBCT? This just seems like a perfect way. And it didn't work. Surprise it. It didn't work. So now we look at, there are no, what I'm, in what I'm saying to you is there are no statistical differences between the dark red bars and the dark blue bars, okay? So even with this additional layer of complexity that seemed to embrace this really interesting aspect of how we interact with our partners, it didn't have an incremental effect beyond what we were already able to do with the traditional model. It's a real surprise. Um, but you can see in the deterioration group, look at the dark red bar and the dark blue bar. You see them down there? you know, basically somewhere between 35 and 40 percent. It doesn't matter which of these two approaches you got. Yeah, question. Right now I'm talking about the IBCT approach. So that is the integrative approach, the blue bars. Okay, you see the blue bars up there? And you see the key on the right side? The darkest blue bars are for integrative behavioral couples therapy. This is the new model. And that five means those are five-year outcomes. The dark red bar, you can see it in the key, is the behavioral approach, the traditional approach, the five-year follow-ups. And what I'm saying to you is that within each of those four categories on the y-axis, those dark blue and dark red bars don't differ. These couples don't differ after five years of treatment. Question? So, yeah, our graphs on the slides are a little different. Your graphs on the slides are different, yes. But they're the same idea. Same right? basic idea. I'm giving you a little bit more detail here. And the idea is, and I collapse them in the book because it doesn't matter. I just merge them together, smush those together. And what you see is that, again, about 30% of the, either of the behavioral or the integrative couples uh, uh, recovered. 30%, that's pretty good, right? You're actually really improved in your relationship, uh, you know, substantially. Uh, and then another 10 to 15% uh, no difference there between the red and the uh, blue bars uh, in the improvement group. So you're getting about half of the couples doing better regardless of the intervention. Couples therapy works for five years if you get one of these two approaches, but the approach itself doesn't seem to matter. Okay? So let me just put up some rough numbers. You don't need to know these exact numbers. What you need to know is the rough idea. So there's 32% uh, are recovering 16%, so about 48% are either improving or recovering. So there's really good news. We have couples therapies that really work a lot of the time. 
The bad news is they don't work all of the time, and we're still trying to figure out what it's going to take to improve